Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. In our last lesson, we studied the birth of Christ according to the Gospel of Luke. We also dug into a good portion of the account where a host of angels visited some shepherds. Sprinkled into that podcast were some events recorded in Matthew, such as the Magi visiting the Savior. We learn that the inn Joseph and Mary tried to get lodging at was more than likely the guest room of a relative. The relatives weren't heartlessly rejecting the family as is so often expressed in telling the Christmas story. The guest room must have already been filled by the time Joseph and Mary arrived. The only place left for them to stay was in the relative's barn that was attached to the house and was probably below the family living quarters. With the story of the shepherds, we only examine the first part where they were visited by an angel who gave them the good news that Christ had come into the world. Then a great host of angels joined the first one and sang the praises of God. These peasant shepherds heard music that very few in this life have ever heard. Those heavenly songs are normally reserved for the redeemed in heaven, but the angels were so happy at what Jesus was doing for mankind that their praise broke through the veil of this world. What an astounding experience that must have been. Now let's pick up with Luke chapter 2, verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Those angels slipped back through the little hole in the veil that separates heaven and earth, and that celestial song was heard no more by mortal ears. The Lord chose to send some angels to those shepherds because they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. That's from verse 16. The Lord sent his messengers to those who would rightly respond to the message. They didn't wait seven days or even hours to respond, but immediately left to find Jesus. And they didn't half-heartedly seek after him, but they hurried off to find the Savior. What a wonderful lesson we can learn from this, that it's right to passionately seek after the Savior, and to not do so is an expression of indifference and apathy. All spiritual delays are dangerous because people may move beyond the favorable time of Christ's invitation and will and even risk obtaining salvation. Obedience is to respond immediately to the command or invitation and disobedience is to delay or to say no altogether. Our response to the invitation or command is also tied into our understanding of who is calling us. The angels were only the messengers or ambassadors of the Lord God. He was the one that sent the angels to invite those men to see the Christ child. Whether the messenger is an angel or mortal, whether they can speak well or with stammering tongue, the prize isn't the messenger, but the one who is inviting us to himself. The angels put those shepherds in awe, but the holy one they went to see was infinitely greater. The angels were mere messengers sent to pronounce the arrival of the King of Kings, the Savior of the world. Was it not right for the shepherds to rush after the one who was proclaimed the Savior? And is it not right for us to rush after the one we know to be the Savior that has invited us to seek after him so that we may find him? After the angels left, the shepherds gathered together, eyes filled with astonishment and overcome with awe. They said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. These men believed the message that the messenger delivered to them. This is an expression of powerful faith. Unbelief is one reason why people say no to God when he calls them to salvation and to follow hard after the Savior. The loss suffered through disobedience is more than any human can comprehend, and so is the gain the obedient will experience in this life and ultimately in their eternal home. The shepherds were given three facts and two signs in verses 11 and 12, that would help them find the one who gives the joy of salvation. The first fact is that Messiah had finally come to Israel. The second is that at that moment in the city of David, the city of the rightful kings of Israel, the Messiah was waiting for them to come to him. And third, he is the long-awaited Savior of Israel. The two signs proving these facts is that the Messiah is a baby wrapped in clothes and that he was lying at that very moment in a manger in Bethlehem. What a fabulous response the shepherds gave. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Oh, for a spiritual hunger in the church where the saints yearn to know Christ in a deeper way and long for His glory to spread throughout the world. 
I can tell you from personal experience that when people respond to the message of salvation and run to altars of repentance with tears streaming down their faces, there's great joy in heaven that overflows into the church. It's the passion of my life to see the lost saved, to see them at altars surrendering their lives to Christ. This is where they will find Jesus and the forgiveness, acceptance, and love they are aching for. My wife and I have a little tradition we do every Christmas. Jessica opens a fat, beat-up folder filled with past newsletters we have sent to our friends and supporters over the years. At five-year intervals, we read the newsletters and are overwhelmed at all the Lord has done for us and through us. The accounts of souls won to Jesus is always a joy and encouragement to us. This renews our desire to keep doing God's will until the day He calls us home. Our longing for home only increases, like Job said in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Does your heart yearn to be with Jesus? In verses 17 and 18 we are told, When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. What an insightful piece of information we are given here. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning him. When we see the infinite value of Christ and of His boundless love for us, then we will want to spread the word about Him and the great salvation He offers. The words of the angels weren't enough. They pointed to Jesus, but the shepherds needed to see Jesus for themselves. Without seeing Jesus, they could talk about the angels they saw and what they said, but it would go no further than being an interesting event that they experienced. When they saw Jesus... Everything the angels said was confirmed. With joy they would tell others of the work God was doing in Israel. To tell a story is one thing, and some people are great storytellers. Yet people can be caught up in the story, and when the story is over, so is the charm. But when people are eyewitnesses of what God has done and is doing, then the Holy Spirit backs up the story with His presence, and this makes all the difference. This account isn't myth or legend. It's an eyewitness testimony of the Messiah, and with excitement and conviction they spread the word concerning him. It was from the excitement of their eyewitness accounts that the people were gripped by their story. That's why Dr. Luke wrote, All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. It would be thirty years before Jesus would begin his ministry, and many of the people that heard the story from the shepherds had died, maybe even some of the shepherds themselves. The story was told and established so that when the day Messiah showed himself to Israel, John the Baptist would build upon the work that the Lord had been doing. We aren't told exactly how the shepherds found where Jesus was staying. Since it was a small village, though overrun with visitors, it probably wouldn't have been hard tracking down at which home was a newborn baby. My next thought, though, is just speculation. Maybe the same star that led the Magi to Jesus led the shepherds as well. But we aren't told anything about this in Scripture, so like I said, it's just speculation. Let's return to a brief statement about Mary before we see one final verse on the shepherds. In verse 19, we are told that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Why was this point inserted into the narrative? I think for a very important reason. What Luke chronicled about the events of Christ's conception, birth, circumcision, and his boyhood encounter in Jerusalem come from the eyewitness account of Mary, and this is very significant. Her testimony was absolutely necessary to establish the validity of the entire life of Christ, beginning with his divine conception. Since it appears that Joseph had died by the time Jesus began his ministry, I would add that Zachariah and Elizabeth were probably dead as well, so the recording of Christ's birth rested upon Mary. All these things that had happened to Mary, Joseph, and the Christ child were being stored up in Mary. The Lord knew what He was doing when He chose Mary to be the young woman that brought Messiah into the world. There must have been more to Mary than just being a godly woman. She must have had a good head on her shoulders and an excellent memory. She was a woman that could process the information from all the miracles and events that surrounded the birth of Christ. 
The idea that she pondered these things means that she was weighing them to understand who this child was and what he had come to do. She wanted to put each event in its proper place so that at the right time she could tell the story in factual order. It's interesting that Mary's response to all that surrounded the birth of her son is put in contrast to what the shepherds did. This wasn't done to disparage the shepherds, but Mary weighed all these events out and kept adding to them over the years while the shepherds were given only one event to proclaim. The final point made about the shepherds is found in verse 20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. These shepherds were highly favored by God. The Lord didn't give this honor to meet Messiah to priests, kings, or world rulers, but to some poor working men. Though Jesus came to be the Savior of mankind, it's people like these shepherds that are prone to receive the message and follow the Master. This is the wonderful picture of some grateful men that were glorifying God over the kindness He had shown them. Some scholars claim that the Greek word used for praising means that the shepherds returned singing praise unto God. The reason for this is that the same word is used in reference to the song the angels sang to the shepherds. A joyful heart loves to make a godly melody. I also think that the shepherds were glorifying God and praising His name because the promised Messiah had finally come to Israel, and they were among the first to know. Everything the angels told these men were proved to be true. None of us like being lied to, and when we are told the truth, we rejoice over it. When the truth relates to salvation and eternal life, then the immensity of this gift should cause us to joyfully praise God. We can't earn salvation, nor do we have any claim upon it. Salvation comes through the gift of God. Those wise enough to see the awesome gift God offers us will obtain the gift of salvation when they lay hold of it by faith. Those who are willfully blind and deaf to God's offer will die without salvation coming into their soul. May God grant us the grace to be as wise as those poor shepherds. The scene changes from that of Christ's birth to that of His circumcision, which is an outward expression of covenant with God. In verse 21 we are told, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise Him, He was named Jesus, the name the angel had given Him before He had been conceived. A similar thing happened six months earlier with John, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. The angel Gabriel that prophesied the birth of John told his parents what they were to name the child. This happened with Joseph and Mary. When the time came to name the child, they called him Jesus. Just look at how fitting was the name Gabriel told Joseph and Mary to call the miracle baby. Jesus means the Lord saves or simply Savior. This isn't about giving a child a name that parents like but his name was a literal revelation of who he is, that Jesus is the Savior. It appears that there were no other family members present at Christ's circumcision, as was the case with John. Since no one objected to the child being named Jesus, it's more than likely that they didn't have any relatives at his circumcision. Joseph had Jesus circumcised on the eighth day according to the command put upon the descendants of Abraham, and this shows the devout life that he lived. Jesus was probably circumcised in the only synagogue that would have been in the small village of Bethlehem. There's a very insightful truth that's found in the circumcision of Christ. Thirty years later, Jesus would stand before John to be baptized by him. John didn't want to perform the act, stating that he needed to be baptized by Jesus, which was true. Jesus told John in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, that he needed to perform the act to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus wasn't a sinner in need of repentance, so he wasn't in need of water baptism. In a similar way, Jesus wasn't born a sinner, so he wasn't in need of circumcision, which is a physical act of cutting off the foreskin to symbolize the cutting off of one's sinful nature and entering into the covenant family of God. The physical act of circumcision is a prophetic act pointing to what Jesus would accomplish for us and what can be obtained through Christ alone. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 tells us that in him you are also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Christ's own circumcision points to something much deeper. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 3, we are told, Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. This was true for Jesus, as it was for all those who are circumcised for religious reasons. 
Jesus was obligated to perfectly obey the whole law, and he was the only human to do this because he was without sin. This astounding truth is laid out in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Jesus was condemned as a lawbreaker on the cross, yet he was the only person that never broke the Mosaic law or had sinned against God in any way, shape, or form. By this act he broke the power of the law to condemn repentant sinners so they can become the righteousness of God through faith. This truth is wonderfully revealed in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. God's plan of salvation is mind-boggling, yet what we can understand should overwhelm us and cause us to be like the shepherds glorifying and praising God. In verses 21 through 24, there are two distinct acts that take place. The first is a circumcision of Christ, which we just looked at, and the second is when Joseph takes his family to Jerusalem to fulfill the requirements of the Mosaic law concerning the firstborn son and his mother. Bethlehem was about six miles from Jerusalem, so for Joseph to take his family to the temple to obey the law's commands wasn't a big hardship. After this event, there is a possibility that the family returned to Bethlehem to let the mother and child grow strong before Joseph took them on the long, hard trip back to Nazareth. Of course, they didn't directly go back to Nazareth. This situation is a challenge in that it appears to conflict with Matthew's account of the Magi visiting the Christ child. They are being warned in a dream not to return to King Herod, and then the dream Joseph had causing them to flee to Egypt. This is why some teachers and theologians claim that the Magi came up to two years after Jesus was born. I don't believe that's the case, but we don't have enough information to give an exact timeline. If the Lord thought we needed that information, He would have supplied it for us. There's no time frame given between when the Magi received their dream to not return to Herod after seeing the Christ child and the dream Joseph received to flee to Egypt to protect the babe. I still believe the Magi came shortly after the birth of Christ, but we have no way of knowing this for sure. My thought is that the dream came to Joseph after returning to Bethlehem, and at the perfect time when the mother and child were able to sustain the long journey to Egypt. The hand of the Father was upon the family of Jesus, so nothing bad was going to happen to them along their journey. Everything was divinely orchestrated, and hell wouldn't be able to do a thing about it. Verse 22 outlines the two ceremonial laws that took the family of Messiah to Jerusalem. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. One ceremonial law had to do with the purification of the mother after childbirth. The other is about presenting the male child to the Lord. The law for the purification of women after childbirth is outlined in Leviticus chapter 12 verses 1 through 8. I will summarize this portion of Scripture. When a woman gives birth to a son, she becomes ceremonially unclean for seven days. On the eighth day, the boy is to be circumcised. Then the woman must wait thirty-three days to be purified from her bleeding. During this time, she must not touch anything sacred or go to the sanctuary until the days of her purification are over. If a woman gives birth to a daughter, everything is doubled. She will be unclean for two weeks instead of one and must wait sixty-six days to be purified from her bleeding instead of thirty-three for a male child. When the days of her purification are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance of the temple a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or dove for a sin offering. These are to make atonement for her being ceremonially unclean from her flow of blood. If the family is poor and cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her, and she will be clean. Did you get all that? I'm glad I'm not under the law. Now here's a challenge with the scenario I presented about the possible timeline for the events of the family of Messiah. None of these events easily fall into line. Would Joseph and Mary be considered rich after the Magi left them costly gifts? Prior to this, the family would have been considered poor, and Mary would have only had to offer two turtle doves, 
and this is what she offered according to verse 24. If the family had become rich through the gift of the Magi, then Mary would have been obligated to offer a year-old lamb, which would have been a costly sacrifice. Since Mary offered the sacrifice of the poor, we must assume that she wasn't rich, but this doesn't mean that the Magi hadn't visited them or given them those costly gifts. Because we aren't given enough information, we must be careful not to get dogmatic in our views about the Christmas story. There are some points that are clear, while others are vague, but this doesn't change the credibility of the story. It's obvious that Joseph and Mary were devout Jews and wanted to raise their miracle child according to the law, which is proved by their doing everything according to what the law demanded. This is why we are told in verse 23, As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. This ceremonial command is found in various places in the Old Testament, but one good example is in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, where the Lord said, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. The King James Version wrote sanctify instead of consecrate. The Hebrew word is about dedicating, separating, or consecrating to the Lord. What does this mean to dedicate or consecrate every male to the Lord? Either the firstborn is offered in sacrifice to the Lord as in the case of an animal or dedicated to God for a service. The Lord made a loophole in this law that's found in Numbers chapter 18 verses 15 and 16. The first offspring of every womb, both man and animal, that is offered to the Lord is yours. But you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver, according to the sanctuary shekel. Unlike the offering the mother had to make for her purification, which could change according to the financial condition of the family, the purchase price to redeem a firstborn son remained the same for everyone. If the firstborn was a daughter that was followed by a son, the son couldn't be offered to the Lord because he wasn't the firstborn child. The Lord proclaimed all the firstborn males as his own, but for the sake of the family, he allowed them to redeem the son by paying five shekels. The firstborn son was still dedicated to the Lord, but his ransom price was paid by the family so he could remain with them. Joseph paid the ransom price to keep Jesus, But Jesus would pay the ransom price to redeem mankind, including his mother and adopted father. In verse 24, we are told that Mary had to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. One dove was for a burnt offering, the other for a sin offering. This was the required offering of purification for a poor woman and gives proof that our Lord's family was poor. That God incarnate was born into a poor family shows how he elevated the poor and was mindful of their need. If Jesus would have been born in the wealth and power of this world, then the poor would have had nothing to do with him. Being that he was poor according to the wealth of this world, those in poverty would see Jesus as one of their own. In this sense, Jesus sanctified the state of poverty by being one of the poor. It shouldn't be shocking to us that the poor have the gospel preached to them, and they are the ones who principally receive it. In the next portion of Scripture, we are still in the setting of Mary's purification and our Lord's dedication, but a new twist is brought into the story. Verses 25 and 26 give us the context. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The King James Version more accurately translates the beginning of verse 25 as, And behold, the end is to show that we are going into a new scene, and behold is given to cause us to pay close attention to what is being said. Though there were probably many Simeons living in Jerusalem at that time, this man's piety and devotion to God causes him to stand out among them all. Central to this is that he was righteous and devout. Simeon was righteous because he strove to obey the law, and he was devout or devoted to God in every aspect of his life. Another expression of his piety is seen in his waiting for the consolation of Israel. The man was living like he believed Messiah was coming to Israel at any moment. This same attitude is lacking in much of the church today in relation to Christ's second coming. People can say they are looking for the Lord's return, but if they don't live like Jesus could return at any moment, then they really aren't looking for Jesus. 
Messiah is here called the Consolation of Israel. And this is a beautiful title that speaks of one aspect of what Jesus came to do. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1 begins a beautiful chapter declaring, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Why? Because Messiah had come, and John his prophet will make ready a people for their God. We are told that the Holy Spirit was upon him, and this happened because of the life he lived and the calling he had to tell people of the coming Messiah. This also refers to the prophetic gifting that was upon him. The Lord revealed that he would see Messiah before he died, and of course this was true. All this came about from the profound relationship Simeon must have had with God. We are given expression to the Holy Spirit resting on him in verses 27 and 28. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. This happened when Joseph and Mary brought Jesus to the temple to be consecrated to the Lord as their firstborn son. As the family of Jesus entered the temple courts where the firstborn were dedicated, Simeon was led by the Spirit to enter and take Jesus in his arms. I don't doubt that many in Jerusalem thought Simeon was extreme, eccentric, or bizarre. Yet this stranger walks up to Mary and takes the Christ child out of her hands. Simeon immediately recognized Jesus through the Spirit. The act of picking up Messiah must have been a powerful experience for Simeon. Under the anointing of the Spirit, Simeon broke out in praise. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Here is a man that walked with God, knew his voice, and longed to go to his eternal home. No mortal told Simeon what to say, who the parents were, or the identity of the babe. He heard the voice of the Spirit that he wouldn't die until he saw Messiah, and he heard the Spirit revealing that this newborn was the one he was looking for. Simeon knew more about God from this statement than most of the educated teachers of the law combined. They couldn't recognize Messiah when he was performing miracles and boldly speaking. Yet in the cooing of a babe, Simeon heard the voice of God. The 1984 NIV began verse 19 with Sovereign Lord, and only a couple of other translations follow suit. Most translations use Lord. This Greek word is only used ten times in the New Testament, which means master. It's interesting that Simeon used the word master in this application. Since the Lord had fulfilled the promise, he told Simeon that he wouldn't die until he saw Messiah. He was now waiting for the master's word to come home. He had literally seen God's salvation. Simeon called the Christ child our salvation. This is who he is, not just something he does. Jesus declared that he was the way, the truth, and the life. These aren't merely things that Jesus gives, but they are revelations of who he is and what he offers. He is the way, for there is no other way to salvation than through him. And he is the truth, so that he only speaks the absolute truth. And he is the life for every living thing that has life because he allows it, and this includes those who will have his eternal life. In the same way, Jesus is salvation. Anyone who wants to be saved can only be saved through Jesus, for he is salvation, and when we have Jesus, we have his salvation. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihp. M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y dot com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And the thirst no more So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing walk